you know, independently each for like about five years and then collectively for about three years. And this is the first time we've uh, presented on the stuff we've been working on together. Um, and so it's really exciting. And so it's also, for that reason, it's also exciting to have, to have you guys here. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna get started. So um, yeah, so uh, the Virginia Folklore Society was um, the one of the first state-run folklore societies in America, um, started in 1913. Um, and for a long time, they were one of the largest uh, collecting bodies in Virginia and doing most of the uh, folklore work in Virginia. But um, they're not talked about a lot in um, the um, narrative of American folk music or like American folklore history. And, um, or at least like, you know, not in like any like real detailed granular way. But um, when we're like doing research in the archive, we found just so much really fun stuff, really um, interesting characters, um, and just like uh, really great material and fascinating stories. So that's what we'll be sharing with you today. Um, so I'm gonna start off actually, so folk, so folk song collecting in Virginia actually started in Harvard um, with Francis James Child. He was an English professor at uh, Harvard University. And um, he was really interested in establishing English as uh, one of the great languages, uh, you know, it's like Greek and Latin, one of the uh, great ancient languages. Um, and uh, so he started collecting these English and Scottish ballads um, <clears throat> as an example of ancient English poetry. Um, he uh, did a lot of collecting work and published uh, his findings in this like massive collection, the English and Scottish popular ballads, they like quickly became canon. Um, and you know, that the child ballads are really where folk song collecting in Virginia started. So um, in the early 20th century, um, uh, people were finding uh, child ballads in America. There was a, a discovery of like 56 of the uh, child ballads in America. And uh, Virginia was considered a hotbed of ballads uh, in, in the United States. Um, like 26 of those 56 ballads were found in Virginia. And of those 26, uh, there were five that were oops, found in no state but Virginia. So um, the Virginia Folklore Society uh, first got started in on April 17th, 1913. Um, that's when they held their first meeting. And it was started by Charles Alfonso Smith. He was a, a English professor at the University of Virginia. Um, and it was started with the, with the express purpose to collect uh, Virginia versions of child ballads. Um, and when they started their first meeting in April 17, 1913, they laid out some ground rules. I have them up here. Um, but the ones that I, what we want to call your attention to right now are just like a couple that we, we think are cool and interesting um, is a uh, number six. So they, he says that officers of the society should be presidents, six vice presidents to be named by the president and a secretary and a treasurer all to be chosen annually. And um, this is just kind of cool because there was a, like a large leadership body, you know, it wasn't just one person. And so that actually it sets the tone for like the more like democratic nature of the society going forward. Um, but also uh, number three, where he says that the first meeting of the society should be held at the time designated by the Virginia State Educational Association for their next meeting and all meetings shall be similarly determined. And why this is important is because at their outset, um, the Virginia Folklore Society um, made a partnership with the State Teachers Association. So they partnered with Virginia school teachers. And the idea was really to get school teachers on their ballad collecting force, to have school teachers going out into the mountains to collect ballads for the Virginia Folklore Society, you know, and submit their findings back to the university. Um, and they, they had a massive uh, effort to get the word out and get as many teachers on their ballad collecting force as possible. Um, Charles Alfonso Smith uh, issued a circular um, called the Great Movement in which everyone can help, where he called specifically on teachers to aid in the ballad movement. Um, that went out to all the teachers in the state, uh, issued by the Department of Public Education. 
Uh, the Bureau of Education issued a pamphlet. They sent 30,000 copies to teachers in all parts of the country um, and sort of announcing the Virginia Folklore Society's start and asking for you know, as much help as they could get. And um, also the Virginia Journal of Education um, in their monthly publications, they devoted a generous amount of space to document the ongoing efforts of the Virginia Folklore Society and to try to get more teachers on board and get as many ballot collectors as they could. They also um, started ballot clubs at the state normal schools, which were institutions dedicated to training teachers. Um, and so, you know, what we have here is the, um, the Farmville Normal School. Um, okay, yeah, the Farmville Normal School, uh, where they had a ballot club and where um, they said in their March 1913 circulars, so this is like, you know, right the month before the Virginia Folklore Society got started, um, they say in their circular um, that uh, Alfonso Smith came and gave a talk. And they said, Smith showed that although Virginia perhaps has a richer heritage of ballads among her people than any other state, less has been done to collect them. Normal school students, he said, have an especially good opportunity to help collecting this poetry of the people because they are going out into all parts of the state as teachers and will come into close touch with the very people who still sing the old songs. And then uh, it goes on to say that a ballad club is being formed at the school under the direction of Mr. Granger. And that's James Granger, who was the president of the Farmville Normal School at that time. And in many places, the Virginia Folklore Society members are very clear about this, the importance of this effort um, to get teachers as ballot collectors. And just really like in many places, uh, really stating the importance of the teachers in this effort. So um, in his uh, A Great Movement, uh, Alfonso Smith wrote that the teachers of the state, especially those in the common schools can help most effectively. And he went on to actually speak directly to the teachers and say, you know, if you know any of your students who knows any of these values, and he had a list of them, if you know any of your students, or perhaps their family members know some, you know, maybe you can ask around. And um, a little while later in 1917, when the collecting effort had started, um, Alfonso Smith wrote in their annual bulletin um, that Virginia has found and rescued more of these old world treasures than any other single state is due more to the interest and perseverance and intelligence of the teachers than to any or to all other causes. And even a little while later in 1930, um, Arthur Kyle Davis, who took over after Smith, when he was reflecting on the society's initial years, um, he wrote that one of the first decisions of the society was that its systematic search for the ballad surviving in Virginia should be conducted through the teachers in the public schools of the state on the theory that these constituted an intelligent class spread into all the far corners of the state. And then he continued, um, this plan to link the ballad quest with the educational system of the state constitutes perhaps the most significant and distinctive element of what I call the Virginia method. So it's really hard, I mean, it's really hard to overstate the importance they saw and like how important um, this partnership was to the Virginia Folklore Society in their early collecting years. Um, and you also see when, when they name um, the collectors who have sort of risen to the top and contributed the most and become like the most active members of the society, they're all uh, teachers or connected to school teachers in some way. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, some of these important players because, uh, you know, they're all interesting people in their own right. We've, uh, they have correspondence in the archive and they're just like, you know, they really jump out as um, their, their personalities really jump out. And that's been a, a real fun thing about uh, the research we've been doing. Um, so one of them was Alfreda Peel. She's a school teacher in Salem uh, in Roanoke County. Uh, she's actually one of my favorites. I, I really enjoy her. Um, she, uh, she was kind of this like boisterous, witty person in, in um, letters. She's always like spreading some gossip or like talking some kind of like talking shit about other people. And that's always really fun to read, obviously. Um, but uh, she was also this really adventurous song collector. And she and her partner, Carolyn Melbard, were um, always like, you know, 
they describe like being like two women on horseback and you're just going out and um, finding these belts. So she was really just kind of like really ready to um, go for it. And she became, she was one of the society's leading contributors like throughout until her death in the 1950s. Um, there's also Martha Davis uh, in Harrisonburg. She was also a school teacher. Um, she, we don't have any photos of her. Actually, the Virginia Folk Horse Society doesn't have any photos of her. Um, she was a lot older than the rest of them, so that might account for why. Um, but uh, she was also one of the more conservative. But she was in correspondence with Alfonso Smith before the society even got started. Um, and she was really this like really enthusiastic amateur folklore collector um, of all sorts of, of uh, material. So I'll, I'll touch on her a little bit later, actually. Then there's James Granger. Um, he was the president of the, the normal school. So, um, you know, he was like, he was a collector, but also more like the person who was in charge of the ballad club and in charge of all these other students who were actually like going out and doing the collecting. But um, uh, they, they, they're really, uh, you know, thankful for him. And, and the Farmville Normal School became a real home for the Virginia Folklore Society, a real like institutional connection. Um, there's Juliet Fauntleroy of Alta Vista. Um, yeah, she was a woman from a really wealthy family in the Lynchburg area, actually descended from Colonel Lynch of Lynchburg. So yeah, um, and her house is now a house museum called Avoca in Alta Vista. Um, and she, she seems like someone who is just really fascinated in collecting of all sorts. Um, she had an herbarium that was noteworthy. Um, and uh, the home also has a, her large collection of uh, Virginia Indian artifacts. Um, so she was, you know, like, and she was also a school teacher. Um, and then uh, there was John Stone of Paint Bank. Um, and he was another school teacher. Uh, he actually was an enigma to us for a while because <laughs> there, you know, there wasn't like, it was kind of hard to tell like what his deal was. He's he moved around a lot. So it was hard for us to like locate him. Um, and, uh, but he was actually the president of the Virginia Folk Horse Society for a while, like 1916 onward. Um, after Alfonso Smith kind of like, Alfonso Smith ceased to become the president and became like this like editor advisor. Um, and John Stone became the president. Um, and um, yeah, but we've, we've, we've got a, a little bit more of an idea about him. There's some uh, papers that have been recently acquired by UVA, which we've been digging into. Um, and he comes out across a little better. We've also gotten to talk to uh, some of his descendants. They've given us an idea of like who he was, um, you know, telling us about like, you know, songs he would sing and stuff like that. Um, and he also, Daniel's really interested. Uh, he wrote some sci-fi, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are the, the main collectors. Um, one of the reasons why the partnership with the teachers is really particularly interesting to me um, is, be it beca is because it puts um, the Virginia Folklore Society into a larger history of uh, women working as amateur folk song collectors in the early 20th century. Um, and you can see this uh, in this uh, chart of the contributors to the Virginia Folklore Society by year, you really see that in their largest collecting years, most of the people who were contributing were women. Um, and you know, and, and this kind of does come as no surprise when you think about the partnership with the education system. Um, you know, like teaching as a profession was very gendered in the early 20th century, actually race and gender, right? All of these are white women. Um, but as you know, it's very gendered. The, the society, uh, the teaching profession was um, associated with like motherhood, domesticity, raising the next generation of citizens, all that stuff. And um, the normal schools were this like institutional body that took on white women as students to train them to become teachers, to kind of keep that, um, you know, that idea of the teaching profession alive. Obviously, you know, not all teachers were women, but you know, you could see that like a large number were and this partnership with the state education system really brings a lot of um, a lot more people into um, the effort and a lot more women into the effort. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> what this partnership also did that I find is really interesting is it changed the division of labor. Um, it usually, or it, the model for folks on collection can usually 
a single active collector, you know, one person or uh, one of two people, a small group of people who would like go out and, and be collecting the stuff together and then come back and look at what they did and, you know, kind of um, parse it all out for um, editing and publication. Um, but with, um, with this partnership, the, the division of labor totally changes. And um, Arthur Kyle Davis uh, wrote about it in um, his article on the collecting and editing of ballots. And so he's saying, um, you know, if it's necessary or desirable to cover a fairly large region um, and to collect a lot of things in a short amount of time, a single active collector will be hopelessly inadequate. Instead, a core of trained workers must be developed, which means that the original collector, like all good commanders in chief, will take less and less to the field, will become more and more an administrator and morale officer, a director of operations rather than an active fighter. And you know, he goes on to say that no one would wish to suppress the old collector editor, of course, but the trend of modern ballot work is necessarily towards organization and a division of labor, not only towards a separation of the functions of collecting and editing, but also towards a multiplication of collectors under a collector in chief and towards a subdivision of editorial functions. And by that, he means um, uh, editors for the work, for the text and editors for the tunes of the ballads. Um, and so, you know, this is really interesting. Uh, it does change um, a lot of things about, um, it does make the Virginia Folklore Society really unique. And um, in one of the ways it makes it unique is because in bringing in a large amount of people who were, you know, doing their own work all throughout the state, um, what the Virginia Folklore Society got coming to them um, was not just child ballots. Um, it was, it was just, you know, a larger scope, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. I mean, so um, in 1913, Martha Davis uh, wrote to Alfonso Smith, and this was just a month after um, the Virginia Folklore Society got started. So she says, you know, thank you for all the pleasant things you say about my contributions to the society in the way of ballads. And then she goes on to say that, you know, However, I'm collecting more things. I'm collecting witchcraft and superstitions, primitive customs and social games, Indian legends, Negro improvisations, and old ballads. Uh, so she's really like interested in more than just the child ballads. She's seeing a lot more when she goes out into the field. Like, you know, she's just seeing like people around Virginia um, in engaging in different kinds of um, folklore, folk song, all that kind of stuff. Um, similarly, we have this book here on the right. Uh, this is Witch in the Mill that uh, Alfreda Peel wrote. Um, and this is a collection. It's like a semi-fictional collection of stories, but they're all based on um, witch lore and superstitions that she learned while she was collecting ballads. Um, and you also see, we don't have a, a picture of this uh, for you right now because we can't get to the archive, unfortunately. But um, you also see that um, even just the songs that are coming in um, are well beyond the child ballads. And the editors really do, you know, most of their work is figuring out, okay, is this actually a child ballad? And, you know, marking like, no, yes, this is a, this is a child ballad. Or no, this is not, um, you know, this is not a true ballad. And so you, so you really get the sense that like what the uh, song collectors were hearing, um, you know, was just way beyond the initial scope of the society. And that's actually gonna come into play later on, which Daniel will get into. Um, another thing that the collectors brought that was beyond the scope of the Virginia Folklore Society's initial vision was music. Um, and I do see this as gendered in a certain way, uh, just because um, you know at this time, uh, women, especially women who were working as teachers, were all uh, were mostly trained as amateur musicians, or they were working as music teachers, or were part of like you know a music club, or music was some sort of their, part of their social life, and it was really like woven into their day to day experience. And also, you know, being out in the field, they would be they would be hearing these songs sung, um, and so in letters from the teachers to the Virginia Folklore Society leadership, you really see. Um, an emphasis on music, and I'm going to go over a couple quotes. Um, so, you know, in 1914, Juliet Fauntleroy wrote to Alfonso Smith, 
And she said, you know, I'm really surprised that so few ballad tunes have been published. I do hope you will publish all the airs you can find. Ballads can never live without music. Can you not induce other ballad collectors to write down the music also, or to get some musical friend to do it for them? And she wrote this like while sending, you know, some handwritten transcriptions that she'd made. Um, and there are three things in here that I want to point out and that actually come up again and again. So it's like worth pointing out. But um, what we see um, here is like is three things, right? So she uh, states how important she thinks the music is, right? Ballads can never live without music. Um, she states some hope that the Virginia Folklore Society will agree with her, um, indicating that, you know, maybe they're not doing that already, right? and they need a little bit of, uh, of persuasion. Uh, and then she also um, indicates that either she um, or a friend that she, ha she knows is, has the capability to uh, write down um, transcribe the tunes. Uh, so it's either she has that knowledge herself or she's connected to someone who does. Um, and so you see that uh, Corita Sloan, who was another school teacher, wrote to Alfonso Smith um, earlier that year, writing, I could recall the tunes if you desire them. And Miss Robertson says she will arrange the music if in your book form music can be planned for, right? So it's another appeal, another sort of like, yeah, you know, I can do this work for you if you want. Um, and then Alfreda Peel, wrote in 1923, um, you know, she says, now the most important thing I have to tell you is that I have a complete set of music made to all my ballads, made by Miss Evelyn Rex of Richmond. So that was a, a, a music teacher that she knew. She wrote it this summer. I know they're correct because I've sung by them. So, and then also, you know, Alfreda Peel was, was performing some of the stuff that she collected. Like she was using it in a different way than the Virginia Folklore Society was. And then she says, you know, don't you want the music before you have your book printed? So, you know, you really see like, they're really pushing for this stuff. And um, because of this, uh, a lot of what we see in the archive are these hand notated um, sheet music. Uh, and um, I'll point out a couple, but, um, you know, they'll say things like, this is, this is it. Um, you know, this one says on the bottom, like collected by Martha Davis. Uh, this is November 18th, 1931. All of these are going to be in the 30s, which is kind of unfortunate um, because it is a later collecting year and we we could show like the earlier ones, but this is what we have right now. Um, but, you know, like you see these like hand transcribed uh, sheet music. And this one's transcribed by Eunice Kettering. Um, you know, this one, here we go. Well, William Riley, sung by Minter Grubb of Bat Creek, uh, collected and notated by Alfreda Peel and Kathleen Kelly Cox, another woman she was working with. Um, you know, this one's sung by Texas Gladden, collected by Alfreda Peel, notated by, uh, they say Catherine Cox, but I think that's the same person, Kathleen Kelly Cox. Um, and then this one's collected by Juliet Fauntleroy. Um, in, you know, you see how it says it's sung by Mrs. Kit Williamson. So that's the singer she's identified by her husband's name and transcribed by Mrs. Paul Cheatham, um, another uh, woman who's, you know, uh, described by her husband's name. You know, the, the collection is really full of this stuff, which is really, really nice. Uh, I don't know, it's just nice to like have that tangible link and just like see the handwriting and just like see the notation writing. It's really cool. Um, so um, in any case, so that actually, so that is how they were operating in their initial collecting period. Um, you can see it returning to this uh, chart that, you know, the, the collecting period roughly lasted for about, or the first collecting period roughly lasted for about a decade with like the most active years um, in 1914 through 1920. There's a real big dip in 1917, 18, and 19 due to World War I. And um, I don't know, maybe the Spanish flu? They don't talk too much about the Spanish flu. They mostly talk about the war, but I kind of feel like it has to be a part of that lull. Um, but in any case, they came back right back in 1920. And um, then by uh, after 1920, when they had kind of got a lot 
of material, they just sent John Stone out to every county that they hadn't already collected a ballot uh, to see if he could find at least one. And so they could see that, you know, we have, we found ballots in every county in Virginia. Um, so from 1992 to 1994, um, he's the one guy who is submitting ballots. And, um, you know, you see a couple other women, it's like Julia Fallmer would submit something, Alfreda Peel would submit something. So, um, but uh, it really is, uh, it's waning down at that point. And at 19, in 1924, Alfonso Smith passed away um, and Arthur Kyle Davis took over um, to edit the collected material into uh, traditional ballads of Virginia, which was published in 1929. Um, and you know, due to a lot of the, all of the work of the collectors, Arthur Kyle Davis was able to boast that traditional ballads of Virginia represented the largest and richest collection of authentic ballads so far brought together in any single state or in any one low ball uh, one ballad collect. Ballad locality in America. Um, he says, you know, 51 of the original ballads, they found 51 ballads in Virginia. Um, and of these 51, some 650 versions of variants or fragments, so quite a large amount of material. Um, and the teacher's uh, efforts to get music considered also really paid off, too, because he was able to boast that tunes had been recovered for all except seven of these 51 ballads, and for some, various tunes. And so that actually, I mean, so that essentially wraps up the work of Alfonso Smith and this like, initial collecting effort. They published traditional ballads of Virginia and it kind of was the culmination of the first period of the Virginia Folklore Society. Um, and then so, so Daniel's gonna take it from there and talk about the next period and um, the recording years. <clears throat> well, yeah, so uh, after 1929, when Traditional Ballads of Virginia was published, the society was in another one of these low, like, dormant periods. Um, and the society members were still corresponded, you know, and they, they held occasional meetings, but all the meetings were held at the, you know, by this executive committee that, you know, existed, uh, that chose when to have meetings, if they had them, and if the society was going to act in any official capacity, these guys would decide, you know, that it was okay. And John Stone was still the president. Uh, J.C. Metcalf was the vice president. We don't actually have a photo of him uh, right now either, but B.C. Moomaw was a, a folklorist in uh, Western Virginia in the Covington area. He was the secretary. A.K. Davis was his archivist. And uh, yeah, I mean, it. you can see that AK had the collecting bug after publishing Traditional Ballads of Virginia because shortly after he gets in touch with John Stone and Moomaw and asks them, hey, what do you think about me starting the drive for later ballads, folk songs, and other folk material in the state? The traditional ballads hot off the press and a consequent revival of interest in folklore. The time seems right to strike out in a new direction. What do you think? And uh, John Stone got back to him pretty quick. He, he was hesitant, uh, you know, because the work had been done and Alfonso Smith was dead. And this was, the, I mean, the beginning of the Great Depression, really. It was really starting to grind away at people. And so he gets back to Davis and he says, Dear Davis, I received last week your letter having a new suggestion for the Virginia Folklore Society. If the society is an empty shell from which the chicken has already hatched and you can make it function again, I think your plan is a good one. Uh, so he kind of gave him the go ahead. No real correspondence, you know, that comes up to Thanksgiving time when the Folklore Society holds his annual meeting. And uh, Stone gets back to Davis saying, I didn't prepare any special programs. Some of our most interesting meetings have been the least formal ones. As there has been no meeting in three years, I did not know the fate of a formal program might be. I'm anxious to know whether there are any and whether the old organization has run its course. And most importantly in this letter, John Stone goes on to describe how he believes the, fun the society should function if Davis is to take over as its you know, editor-in-chief, so to speak, and taken into this new incarnation you know, in the Great Depression years. He says, I guess I'm visionary, but my idea of the Virginia Folklore Society is that it is a permanent elastic organization it is controlled by no one person, that its members gather folklore as a pastime, 
and to pay all expenses, it should share in the publication profit, profits, if there are any, and there were very few, um, that all material gathered belonged to the society, and that the society would choose its editor if the collection was ever you know, large enough to justify it in any subsequent publications. And uh, he says, you know, these are just my views. You don't agree and you may be right. I'm going to Richmond to find out. And uh, we don't really know the true outcome of this meeting. It's not really spelled out in the letters or in the archive. But what is clear is after this period, uh, you know, Davis starts getting in touch with a lot of the old reliable collectors of the society. And he's asking, you know, for you know, continued collaboration. And shortly after that, stuff just starts rolling in. And after, you know, 1931, the society is, you know, gaining steam again. They use a lot of the same stuff that they used the first time around. They, you can see the UVA newsletter here. Um, they corresponded. You can see a list of the members in 1931 who they were going to send stuff to. Uh, it's miscellaneous correspondence here. And, uh, they gave lectures, you know, newspaper articles, and they used the talk radio, which was a big one that, you know, the, the initial phase hadn't been able to, uh, to use. And because so many of the original members were interested in this new phase of society, they were able to, quote, attain substantial results with far less fanfare. Collectors of the society had been holding in reserve their miscellaneous folk song material already collected until it should officially be called for. Well, the call was issued and they got everything. They didn't just get the ballad material, they got the folk song material, they got the witchcraft, the leech lore, the, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's all in there um, from, you know, there's really 15, 16 years of the society. And uh, from this point on, the society is, uh, functions more as a, a direct exchange of personal letters between A.K. Davis, as editor in chief, and uh, each individual collector. Now, Davis knew that the best way to go back and preserve this material was by using a uh, record cutting machine. And I mean, you know, they had the wax cylinder machines at this point. He had been in touch with everybody from Edison to this company, speakerphone company, to you know, a bunch of others that are, you know are in the archive. But he didn't have the money. He was a professor at the University of Virginia during the Great Depression. You can see that one of these units was uh, $750 for the Carnegie Institute. Uh, this other one's $375. He just didn't have that type of uh, cash, but he knew that, you know, where he says here that a collection of phonographic recordings of genuine folk singers would preserve both the text and the tune and would supply an objective performance available for frequent rep repetition and if, if necessary, against any which musical notation might be tested. And you know, it's funny here looking back with a modern lens that you know they were still so hyper aware of getting being able to write down the tune accurately when they you know kind of realized that they had these replayable you know machines. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, you know, he struggled a lot in the early 30s to find the funding and the support to actually do the work. We have the support of the society, but it gets good fun one. So um, fate would have it that there would be another young collector looking for a record cutting machine. And this would be uh, Lorenzo Dow Turner of Fisk University. And uh, uh, he, <laughs> sorry, I lost my place here. Turner is, uh, is you know, considered to be the uh, first African-American linguist in America. He is the father of Gullah and Geechee language studies. Um, at the, this time in the early 30s, he was really working towards establishing Gullah and Geechee languages of Georgia's and the Sea Islands and Carolinas as a scholarly study. And eventually he was successful. He's now known as the father of Gullah and Geechee linguistic studies. Uh, he had received a $2,000 grant from the American Council of Learned Society. And because it was the depression, they were trying to really stretch all that funding as thin as they could. And he had, you know, Davis applied as well. And the American Council of Learned Societies awarded them both a $2,000 award for and access to this uh, Fairchild recording machine, which you can see the schematics of in the background here. And uh, they would share the award money and the machine for a four year period while 
Turner was doing his work in uh, farther southeast, and Davis was doing his uh, folk song work in Virginia. And uh, they, you know, it, they really display a remarkable partnership, especially at this really especially violent time in Virginia's Jim Crow and eugenics era um, politics. Um, so, you know, I mean, when I learned of this partnership, which hadn't really been prior, pr talked about prior, you know, uh, I was kind of really surprised, you know, uh, for some reason, nobody really thought much to mention it before. So they worked together from 1932 to 1936. They uh, met all over the place. They met in Raleigh sometimes. Sometimes Turner would come up to Charlottesville, sometimes they'd do a shiver machine. But they shared information through letters. And, uh, you know, here we have an example of, you know, Turner just giving Davis a heads up. He's saying, hey, look, you know, you might want to carry a few fuses around. I've blown a few using this machine. That's early on, you know, after Turner got the machine from the company. Here's a, a year later, he's saying, hey, the volume regulator's not working. It's too loud. Can you suggest a remedy? Uh, you know, he says, my greatest difficulty was getting the machine out of the car. Herefore, I shall carry it on my trunk rack as you did. Your cover will be very useful. So Davis made a, you know, a, a trunk rack and a, a cover for the machine that he gave to Davis. And they shared that. He, uh, he, he sent you know, this, this, uh, this letter along saying that he had, you know, he's out of the needles. He's out of these, di these aluminum discs that they were using. And that he was, you know, thankful that Davis sent along so many extras, and uh, you know, he probably won't need the machine until May, and Davis can have it again. And even a year later, he says that the machine is in great working condition. The installation of the new volume knob was all that was necessary, and uh, the bills for I'm um, closing as well as uh, thank you for the check that you gave me. And you can see that they had this uh, this great working relationship where they really solved the problems. Here's a little. Uh, delivery slip from the archive from Davis sending the machine back to Nashville at Fisk, uh, you know, and uh, unfortunately, I have not been able to locate Davis's side of the correspondence. I think it's probably at Fisk University. Um, the pandemic kind of shut that, you know, down. Um, but, you know, it's clear that they had a level of mutual respect and, you know, they had a great working partnership. Um, Hope you find that stuff in the future. Now, so when Davis got the machine, he wasted no time. I mean, they only, each of them only had a half year interval to share this machine. You can see here, Davis is on a country road. That's his Ford Coupe with a, with the recording machine mounted on the back. And he drove that thing around everywhere as much as he could. And I mean, got a lot of stuff done. I mean, in the end, he was able to record at least 173 discs, although that number is still a little speculative at this point. And he was able to add for the first time audio material to the archives, uh, the size archives. These recordings were made statewide, although both of the recordings, you know, were focused primarily in the Piedmont and mountainous regions. Uh, since a battery generator for the machine was not available due to its high cost, they had to record wherever there was power. And a lot of times that was in some of the collector's homes, like Juliet Fauntleroy. They recorded first in her living room at Avoca, the home that she lived in, and, or the Farmville Normal School. Um, it's also likely that they used public spaces to do these field recordings at. In some of the recordings, we hear a train car door slam and uh, train whistles being very close to the microphone. So you can imagine that, you know, some of the only, when you're down in Southwest Virginia or in Southside or wherever, I mean, you know, these rural communities, the train stations were probably some of the only places that had power during, these years. So he used that. Unfortunately, Davis didn't take very good field notes. He wasn't, a, you know, he wasn't a great field worker as a folklorist. That wasn't really his strong suit. So we don't really know where a lot of the recordings were done. We just know the location, the town, maybe the performer. Um, but, you know, they, they did a lot of work. And there are recordings made that are not represented on this map. But uh, this is the bulk of the performance you can see going up from the Loudoun County all the way down to the North Carolina border. It kind of cuts down from the fall line all the way down into the western part of the south, southwest Virginia area. And uh, so, you know, the, the material that he was covering was a broad range of music. 
And uh, this uh, between 1932 and 1936, most of it is unaccompanied ballads. You know, it's no surprise again, that's the focus of society, but there's a lot more other stuff. Uh, there are more women represented in the collection than men at about a two to one uh, ratio. Uh, there are also a large percent of the, of the performers that were born in the late 19th or uh, mid 19th century, around the time of the Civil War. Uh, I think this is a un very unique part of this collection. There is an old, old, an older, old timey feel to some of the music that's really hard to put your finger on. And I think it's because some of these people were born, you know, uh, in very rural communities around the time of the Civil War. Um, uh, there's also African-American material in the collection. It's likely that it, they are the first field recordings of Black music recorded in Virginia, period. Uh, there's string band music, fiddle tunes, dulcimer, although the dulcimer recordings are almost completely unlistenable. They were ruined, unfortunately. There's piano. Miscellaneous material, uh, riddles, uh, in, there's a couple long interview tracks. Um, and uh, there are also a few songs that are only known in this collection. There are some that, you, I mean, uh, this one song called Far Fanal Town was never found in any of the child ballads or anything. It's only been found in Campbell County. There's a couple examples of this material that's only been found in Virginia and it's really unique. And um, all in all, the Virginia Folklore Society recorded collection is a completely unique body of work. It is, uh, it's massive. It sits at around 800 tracks. Um, there are some pretty well-known names in there like Texas Gladden and, uh, you know, uh, the Sheeler family, you know, uh, they were from Meadows of Dan area and, uh, Horton Barker is another well-known name, but the majority of the performers are brand new to the, you know, to the, they were never recorded commercially and they didn't have any lasting power off of, off of these discs or out of the archives. So it is a massive collection of music and it has been confirmed that it is among the earliest field recordings of folk song in this country. And that is uh, by Charles Perdue, who is a later Folklore Society worker talk about in a little bit. And uh, we're gonna demonstrate some of this material now in a little short uh, five minute video that we made. And if, uh, Wayne, if you could kind of cue that up, that'd be great. And we'll kind of pick it up, um, you know, after that, but I hope you enjoy this little video. And this is just a really little bit of what's in the collection, so. This is the old ballad of Lord Bateman, sung by Miss Ruby Bowman of Laurel Fork, Carroll County, Virginia. In trouble, in trouble, in every degree, sorrows are plenty, no pleasure for me. These are two old-time fiddle tunes, Cabin Creek and Forked Deer, played by Bill Sheila and Otto Sheila of the Meadows of Dan, Virginia. Thank you. 
spiritual called Prepare Me Lord, sung by the Gospel Train Quartet at Charlottesville, Virginia. ballad of Barbara Allen, sung by Mrs. Fanny Grubb of Roanoke County, Virginia. This song is called The Gospel Train, sung by Carter Wick of Charlottesville, Albemarle County, Virginia. My mother and father, they had a hard time, but now they're sitting down. My mother and father, they had a hard time, now they're sitting down. My mother and father, they had a hard time, working down here to gain that sound. They got a home in the kingdom, now they're sitting down. This is a fiddle tune called Sir Henry, played by Mr. J.S. Witt of Salem, Roanoke County, Virginia. All right. All right, we got to switch back. We got to switch back. How do we... Let's see. Start. Um, let's see. Hey, okay. Well, let's get back to us. All oh. right. Sure. Sorry about that. There it is. There it is. Um, so yeah, so this is just a little bit of what's in the collection. I mean, there's so much that they, you know, just did in those four years that is available in the sound collection. Uh, and I really encourage anyone who's interested in this to go to the link at UVA and uh, UVA is now digitized and hosted all of the material that, you know, we just kind of sampled. And we'll get more into that in a minute. But um, yeah, after these years, after these collection years, things slowed down again. Uh, you know, the, the Great Depression continued to roll on and World War II came and the collectors of society started to age out. I mean, a lot of these people were born in the 1870s, and by the 1940s, they were starting to old. So looking back, Davis says in 1943 that at this point, the society, as so far as regularity of meetings is concerned, may be thought of as in a state of approaching a suspended animation. Its essential work of collecting and preserving the folklore of the state had been carried forward in the field and the office. The campaigns of the 1930s have brought a total of 3,000, some uh, uh, 
folk songs to the society's collection, as well as 650 of the items announced in traditional ballads of Virginia. The more recent phase of the society's collection had brought a total of 2,469 items. So, I mean, you know, just in those 10 year period, they got a lot more material than they did in the first period. And uh, in addition, you know, like we said earlier, consider considerable body of miscellaneous folklore materials, such as folk tales, riddles, proverbs, signs, superstitions, had all been received. Uh, you know, the war kept raging on and they kept trying to, you know, hold meetings and a local member of the society, Fred Knobloch, you know, would go on to make some of his own recordings. You guys just heard one of them. Uh, he was a school teacher that did recordings in Southside, Virginia, and then later on in the 60s made tape recordings for the society in Southwest Virginia when he was principal of the school. He continued the work. Davis was continuing his career as a um, English professor at UVA and did this work on the side and he acted as a mentor to different students such as people like Paul Clayton Worthington, some people might be aware of him, uh, he, AK was a mentor to him and had this young crop of students doing work for the society in a far less official capacity and uh, you know, these guys were also involved in early preservation methods of this material. But even by the 40s and 50s, the aluminum discs were starting to decay. They got even got tape machine to try to transfer everything to tape. And I don't think they ever got it all done, but they got recordings of them partying and having drinks and, you know, singing songs and stuff. And AK, you know, kept plugging along and uh, published a couple more books in 49 and another one in uh, the early 60s called More Traditional Ballads of Virginia and uh, kind of enjoyed a little revival of folklore and folk song interest until his death in 1972 and uh, at this point you know he was the last original member of the society to pass away and the society you know was kind of in uncharted waters yet again in the uh, late 60s early 70s when uh a young couple at the time, uh, Nancy and Charles Perdue, took over the um, society and kind of brought it into its most recent incarnation. And it is uh, really important that we say that we would not be able to do anything in the archive if it hadn't been for the you know, 30, 40 years of work that these people had put into it. They, uh, organized the Virginia Folklore Society papers. They organized Davis's whole lifetime of correspondence into a researchable archive. It's a massive collection. I mean, it's like tens of thousands of pieces of paper. They produced their own films that we're hoping to screen later on. They produced these, some of these books that are pictured here as mostly WPA material, uh, really great stuff, um, enslaved narrative, narratives of the enslaved experience. Uh, their Foodways book is amazing. It's like, that's my favorite. It's really cool stuff in there. And uh, they, you know, established the society as a 501c3 and kind of took it into the 21st century um, where, you know, where we found it. And unfortunately, when I started researching the uh, Virginia Folklore Society, Nan Perdue had just passed away. And so we've had a uh, hard time, you know, really getting to speak with the family about, you know, their legacy, but um, we could give a whole presentation just on their work uh, alone. It's really remarkable stuff. And that's kind of where I'll let Aldona kind of take it back over and briefly kind of just fill you guys in on what we've done, where we hope to go and, um, you know, all that. Right. Um, yeah, and I should also add that um, before, uh, before, uh, the Purdue's kind of stopped, uh, you know, running the Virginia Folklore Society and before their death. Um, Nan Purdue was really interested in um, in releasing the recordings in some form. It sounds, from um, email correspondence we've been able to see, it sounds like there was uh, maybe a problem between uh, her and the UVA library, but we're not quite sure. Um, and also, um, uh, the Virginia Folklore Society did actually transition more or less into um, what's now uh, Virginia Folklife, uh, which is part of Virginia Humanities. And so that's a, essentially, I mean, I think they're doing quite different things, but uh, that is the trajectory of, um, of the, how, where the Purdue's, how they passed along. Um, but um, we've been doing, you know, our own research into the Virginia Folklore Society and what we've showed you today is it's like 
you know, a small snippet of what's in the archive and, you know, what we thought would be captivating and would tell this like nice, uh, nice story of, you know, just the society through um, the years and, you know, the important events. But there's really so much more in the papers. And, um, you know, hopefully that will come out um, in further things that like we write about or talk about. Um, and we, there's also just a whole bunch of material that we've only just gotten into or haven't been able to get into. Um, so one of the things that we've been fortunate uh, to get is um, what we're calling the Hugh Gildy papers. So Hugh Gildy um, was the last uh, treasurer that the Virginia Folklore Society had had. Um, and he is just like this really meticulous organized um, person who's very interested in collecting. And so he's got a bunch of um, ephemera, correspondence, um, all this kind of stuff that you can see letters and like, uh, looks like a postcard with that monkey. Um, and he's, we got in touch with him early in 2020. Um, and uh, he's been kind enough to gift us a lot of um, the material that he's collected in the hopes that, you know, it's, you know, maybe we'd find it interesting and we do. Um, and that's actually how I've learned that Nan Perdue was interested in um, releasing the recordings. So um, there's still a lot more we have to dig into and kind of like piece together, like, you know, what this means and like what kind of this says to us. But um, we have the Hugh Gildy papers. Um, the University of Virginia has also recently acquired more of um, the Purdue's papers. So, you know, one of the reasons why we haven't um, gotten into the Purdue years so much is partly because of our own initial interest, but partly because um, the archive is incomplete, or at least has been. Um, and it's become more complete recently at the start of 2020, uh, actually, no, end of 2019. Um, the uh, University of Virginia Library acquired more of the Purdue's papers. And these are part of the Kevin and Barry and Kelly Scott Purdue Archive of Traditional Culture. Um, our good friend Sophia Bramowitz was actually the library worker who was tasked with um, compiling the index of the archive index. Um, and so if anyone's actually interested in exploring this collection more, um, we'd be happy to facilitate, um, you know, that connection with Sophie and maybe she could be a nice guide to, uh, you know, help anyone who's interested get started. Um, but yeah, that's a whole archive that is really underexplored. And the only papers we really have been able to explore is the John Stone papers to just figure out a little bit more about John Stone. Um, and also the uh, uh, recordings have recently been digitized. So someone asked the state of the recordings now. So the University of Virginia, actually, our, our other good friend, Steve Villarreal, the audiovisual conservator at the University of Virginia Library, um, wrote and received a preservation grant um, to uh, make digital copies of the aluminum discs. So um, those are available through the University of Virginia Library website and um, anyone can go and listen to them. Uh, the grant was just for preservation, so there's no mastering or anything. So, you know, what they're, you know, how they came out is, is how they sound now. Um, but it is a good accessible archive and there's a lot of possibilities now that um, that these songs are uh, in a digital format uh, for everyone to listen to. So some of the work that we've been doing um, has been in just mostly like informal stuff with friends and just like whatever we can do. Uh, but some of the stuff we've been doing is um, trying to figure out more about the singers who were recorded in the 1930s and, and beyond. And a lot of, uh, a big way that we've been doing it is just going on Ancestry.com. Um, and the, this middle picture that you see is uh, from an Ancestry night that we held, um, where, you know, basically got a bunch of people on their laptops. Um, everyone's like logged in to Ancestry. We've got a couple of accounts. Um, and you just kind of pick a singer and try to figure out as much as you can about them, their family, you know, where they're from. You can see how, what they worked as um, in the census records and just kind of getting a little bit more of a picture of who they were than is represented already. Um, and so that's been really fun. And, um, and also for, um, for women singers, a lot of times they're identified by their married name. And so Ancestry allows us to, to um, you know, get their like maiden name. Um, and then, you know, you can see their family tree, right? So separate from their husbands, they get an idea of like who that person was. 
So we've been doing that. We had a couple of ancestry nights, a very fun ancestry and chill. Um, and the ancestry has also uh, allowed us to um, get in touch with some of the living descendants of uh, some of the folk singers um, and uh, be able to reconnect them with the recordings of their ancestors, uh, who many of them haven't uh, actually heard those before. Mm -hmm. And how much, like, about how much you think we, um, like Daniel, a, Daniel Olson has done that. We've probably done about, we've probably connected about a third of the material back with the uh, family members that it came from. Uh, mostly online, but we've been really lucky to do a little bit of it in person too. It's been fun. Yeah, so these, um, these pictures on the outside of uh, this slide are uh, from a trip that we took uh, down to Saltville, not Saltville, um, sorry, down to Salem uh, to uh, meet the family of Texas Gladden and uh, share with them some of the recordings of her um, and just kind of talk to them about you know, their memories, their connection to the songs, how they're feeling, just basically whatever they wanted to talk about, we were willing to listen. And that was a really, really fun time. Um, yeah, so that's us up there. Yeah, and this is a photo of um, the Saltville, kind of chill Howie area. And um, another thing that we've been doing is taking the archive from UVA and giving it back to other local institutions, other local museums. Uh, the, here is the uh, Museum of the Middle Appalachians. Um, and you know, they uh, part of the whole thing has just been giving the material back to these different collections getting the stuff from their collections for our own archive that now are part of the Virginia Folklore Society archive. And um, so this is a photo that I took down there on one of the trips to see the uh, museum. And this is uh, some members of the Campbell family uh, writing down some stuff for us, their memories about the Gladdens and the Smith family. That's uh, Mike and uh, Jeff Campbell on the left. And then this is a uh, man named Tom Hagee, who is not a family member, but is a, we're also interested in getting in touch with musicians that played with these people. You know, we've been lucky to meet a lot of folks. Tom is just a, one of the guys that played tunes with these guys in the 30s and 40s and 50s. With, yeah, with the Gladden Smith families, mm -hmm. like Texas Gladden, Hobart Smith. Specifically here in um, Salt Hill. And then uh, here's a little family reunion that we had another time with the uh, Gladden family. It's uh, really great that we got to do this. This house is the one that uh, was built by Texas Gladden's husband, and uh, the family no longer has it in uh, their possession anymore. They've lost the home. So we got to all get together there and you know talk with them. Uh, there'll be a little bit more about that later. But yeah, so the connection of the material back to the communities has just been a huge part of this project. It's not something you can really publish or you know really uh, express in the same, you know, physical way, but it's been a really fun, uh, rewarding thing to do that's made us feel closer to the material as well. And uh, yeah, so I guess now... Um, well, and like um, oh, some yeah. of the stuff that we... <laughs> some of the stuff we that's okay. Some <laughs> of the stuff we want to do going forward, um, you know, we we're kind of hoping at the start of 2020 that like this would be the year we'd get everyone together and, you know, have like a meeting and, you know, maybe we can get the society started. Um, and obvious, for obvious reasons, that wasn't able to happen, but it's still something we're really interested in doing. Um, and uh, we're really inspired by uh, how John Stone laid out the Virginia Folklore Society in 1930, where, you know, it's controlled by no one person. Um, it's, it's basically a, a, a collection of an organization of people who are interested in the material and have, um, you know, are are interested in collecting folks folklore and stuff as their pastime and just getting together and talking about it just creating like you know a real democratic organization controlled by nobody everything is shared you know no one's really like profiting off of it um or like you know like unequally like gaining from it i don't know but just like yeah, like a collection of people who are just interested in this. And we would love to get that together. Maybe like have a society going and like do the whole um, annual meeting newsletter kind of deal. Um, hopefully that's coming um, along the pipeline. But for now, we're just trying to get the word out and share with as many people and just like, you know, see what where the interest is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think at this point, we're going to continue on um, it just uh, that's that's the end of what we have to say. We've got a, a fifteen minute um, 
like documentary video, which was uh, based off of an interview that Daniel did with Vicki Miller, uh, Tax Fund's granddaughter. And um, I'm just gonna play that for you as just like, you know, something that, um, that we've done. Um, and then we'll have a, a little uh, question and answer period after that. So um, yeah, thank you so much for attending and we'll uh, talk to you guys in a little bit. So yeah, Lane, if, um, yeah, there we go. Texas Glad. Cool. Okay. We can just go. Yeah, I don't know if we talked about some of the things like Granny um, made long before salsa and pico was uh, popular a popular food granny would make what she called hot stuff and that's all it was <laughs> was salsa or pico <laughs> yeah <laughs> Texas and Jim come to Salem and like how did they end up so his family was from here um well I don't know how they ended up here I you know because all of granny's family was in Saltville and I don't remember ever seeing any of Pap's family in uh, Saltville so I don't know where all they went. We knew of Uncle Dave, who was out in Arizona, but, um, you know, Pap had, all, you know, he the only family members I got to meet were on Granny, Texas side, and that was Uncle Hobart and Aunt Virginia and Wiley and Charlotte and Maud, all of them. And as kids, it was all oh, we're going to Saltville, and everybody was sitting and listening to everybody play. I never, I don't remember going to Saltville before Granny died, though. Mm -hmm. um, she died when I was nine. Mm -hmm. What are your earliest memories of her? Sitting on her lap and her singing to me. It was the best lap, you know. Um, I always felt secure, loved when I was in her lap. Mm -hmm. But Granny, you know, she had her hands full. She had all these kids, and in a family like that, especially after the Depression, you know, Granny, um, these kids, when they got big enough, they had to do their fair share for the family. They had to help with the gardening and taking care of the animals and cooking. That's why all of us can cook. Is It's just been something that you had to learn to do to give back to the family. And their, <laughs> their elopement is hilarious. That just shows how, how high-spirited both of them were. I mean, you know, they ran off. Her father believed, truly, that those were his daughters and they were to stay with him from now on. And Granny was the only one that had the courage to run. And so they ended up, uh, he had her arrested and uh, she, told, she told the sheriff, she had to go to the bathroom 
and the sheriff let her go and she climbed out the bathroom window and they got up some kind of horse and buggy or something. I don't know what they got, but they went to the next town, which was probably Bristol, and caught the train. By the time he caught up with them, it was too late. They were already married. Mm -hmm. Their wedding, they, everybody said, it'll never last, it'll never last a two-week courtship, and they got married, and they got through every hard thing by clinging to each other. When she practiced, she would sing into a mason jar. That was her own little surround sound world to where she could hear herself and develop strength of, uh, you know, so that she could be heard because lots of times her singing had no microphone. And uh, so she would practice. She would sing into mason jars because she could hear herself. Hmm. That's amazing. Have you ever tried it? I've tried it and yeah, it kind of does work. It sings right back to you. The girls and I did part of a video of us out there singing into the mason jars. I gave them each one of Granny's mason jars. That's cool. I remember, you know, the big prize things were those albums, that red album mm -hmm. that came from the, what is that, the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. that, you know, that being something that everybody took a great deal of pride in because, uh, you know, for years they didn't realize what she was. I had no idea. Mom said that, you know, the movie uh, Hear Your Banjo's Ringing, that movie came out as an educational movie to teach about American Appalachian folk music. And her being 14 or 15 years old, she was absolutely mortified when they showed it in her school. And they said, oh, this is Wilma Gladden's uh, mother. And she was like, head down on the desk. And, but you know how teenagers are. They're mortified of everything. Did Texas ever talk about, or do you know anything about, like, who she learned a bunch of these songs from? Or like her mother. Her mother sang these songs and Granny could hear a song once and remember all the words, remember the tune. It was amazing. If I just wish, you know, Mom said her biggest regret was Granny wanted her to write down these songs. She wanted somebody, anybody in the family to write down these songs, and it didn't get done before she died. She must have known I was going to be a dog, like a dog with a bone, because I can't leave it alone, you know. Anything that I can find out about her, I do. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about Texas's poetry a little bit? She wrote about things she loved, and one of my favorite things is not a poem. It's just a list of things she loved. Uh, hearing the children laughing and singing, swinging their books, walking away from school, walking home from school. The way the mountain is painted by the Creator, all the beautiful colors of autumn, the looks on my children's faces when I'm making a cake. I mean, the bare bone pleasures of life is what she loved. Family, her heavenly father, um, simple things, flowers, just the way the world looked in the different seasons. Her favorite color was red. She used to tell people she loved any color as long as it was red. And that's my favorite color. 
what blew me away is since I had only seen pictures in black and white, Aunt Mildred, who died when I was, I think, eight, she is on the end. She's got red heels on. I was like, yeah, red heels, of course. Grammy was not a complicated woman. If you didn't mistreat somebody she loved, you know, if you were loved by her and Pap, you were well loved. One of the things that I thought was amazing, and all of her children took after them in being very giving. They were, uh, everybody in this family has always been very giving. If people would fuss at her during the Depression, if somebody came to the door wanting something to eat, and she would give them money and say, go buy a chicken. And they'd say, why do you do that? What if they don't come back? Well, no, not to give them any money next time. But, oddly enough, they always came back with the chicken. Granny always cooked it up, shared it. You know, her, uh, her most important thing was taking care of her family. And uh, both her and Pat totally believed in helping the downtrodden. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the golden wedding anniversary poem. And for our children on this day, and that was uh, December 28, 1962. And those are the pictures from that event right there. And uh, it, again, we are alone, dear, as we started out in life. You were young and full of hope, and I, your happy wife, we courted it in the reindeer, and both were soaking wet. The rain drops in your curly hair I never shall forget. Our meeting on the hill that day was not just by chance, or it never could have been just one lifelong romance. Two strangers reared so far apart the meeting was so rare, it must have been ordained in heaven for you to meet me there. It has not been all smooth sailing. There have been rocks, reefs, and shoals. But our love, unfailing, has comforted our souls. We know the time is coming soon to break our family tie. But tis not all of life to live, nor all of death to die. In all kinds of weather, rain, sleet, or snow, we've come a long way together, and we still have a long way to go.
All right, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody, and uh, yeah. checking everything out. We're free to take any questions that anyone has. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I hope, I hope you guys enjoyed it. it was, it's been really fun to share. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If anybody's um, interested in- Oh, uh, yeah. What's up? We got our email addresses. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, email our email addresses were in the last slide. Yeah, Let me pull this back up, um, just in case if anyone wants to get in touch with us. Here is the way to do so. And we can put you in touch with anybody else that we talked about, too. Um, oh, next one. Boop. <laughs> but yeah, if anybody wants to um, get involved or wants to know more, um, we have a Google Drive where we can, I mean, we can give you access to 70, 80 pages of notes and, you know. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Um, so like, um, yeah, we've been doing this ancestry night and we've got this Google doc and, or sorry, Google drive. Um, and you know, if anyone is interested in, in contributing or adding, um, here's our email addresses. We can add you to the Google drive. Um, you know, and if, if we're all like trying to stay at home as much as possible, it could be, it's really fun. A uh, nice like nightly project, just grab one of the singers, um, get on ancestry, see what you can find and like, um, plug that back into the Google Drive. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this. Screen. Um, hopefully, everyone who wants the email address has written it down already. If not, um, you can uh, just kind of holler. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, and the email address is Daniel yeah, with, it without is. an E. It is. That's not a that's not a misspelling. No. <laughs> <laughs> D-A-N-I-L Bachman. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for uh joining us tonight. And thanks for Rhizome for hosting us. And um I think yeah, there's some questions in the chat. Um any versions of Shady Grove in the collection? Again? Not that I'm aware of. No versions of Shady Grove that I've heard. But yeah, but at least recorded, probably written, but not you know, we don't have a recording of it. That was the only question I saw that I don't think we answered. <laughs> but yeah, no, really feel free to get in touch with us anytime about this stuff though, because you know, we're really just gonna keep, you know, plugging away with research and work. And hopefully when we can all get together, we can do a big uh, kind of big party and get people together and talk about this stuff in person. Oh yeah, and, and Steve wrote in the chat that the genealogy work is great as it feeds into library name authority work. So um, yeah, who's the, um, we've got, someone who's adding like uh pages for each of the singers now mm -hmm. um is that person? yeah we have some uva um librarians that are kind of on in their off time kind of helping us with the collection too yeah and creating like official pages <laughs> for each of the singers as like as, as a recorded uh folk singer so that could be cool and so you can contribute to that <laughs>